we just had a wedding, so finally all four of our sons are married. <laughs> Quick picture, it happened a couple months ago. Let's see if they're up there. Uh, there they are. And uh, we, for those of you that don't know, we have four sons. And now we have four daughter-in-laws. Can I tell you a quick story about our newest daughter-in-law? Her name's Maddie. When I was uh, 2007, I was preaching at the Hillsong Conference in Sydney, Australia. There were 22,000 people there. In between the sessions, they called for two Americans to volunteer. My son, Alec, at 15 years old, runs up there. They said, we want you to sing the Star, Spar, Star Spangled Banner in the key of C. His face went white. <laughs> then all of a sudden, somebody started singing from behind the curtain in front of the 22,000 people. He started hamming it up. My wife and I are laughing hysterically at our 15-year-old son. A woman from Fiji taps my wife on the shoulder, and she said, that son will marry an, a, a daughter of Australia. Well, we never told him until he told us that he would marry Maddie, but Maddie is a daughter of Australia. Her parents are pastors in Australia. Isn't that not amazing? And then um, we, uh, we had a new one since I've been with you last, and that is Scarlett. Scarlett, I want to show you a picture of Scarlett. Look at those eyes. She is looking right through your soul. You better be careful with her, all right? She's going to be a fun one, all right? And then Azzy, Azariah, came two months ago, and that's little Azzy. Finally, I got a boy who looks Italian in this family, all right? So anyway, that is an Italian boy right there. That's my family. I deeply love my family, and I will be honest with you, in being in ministry for four decades, I used to be so enamored when somebody had... 25,000 people in their church. You know, it really, really, really touches my heart when I see a man of God who's been in the ministry for years, a woman of God who's been in the ministry for years, and their children love them, and their children are serving God. When I look at this family, the way your two sons passionately serve God, the way they honor you both, I'm just so honored to be your friend. Thank you, sir. Amen. Let's pray and let's listen to God tonight. Amen. Let's believe for him to speak to us. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this church. Thank you for this renewal services. Lord God, you promised that you would renew us when we would seek you with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, soul, bodies, and strength. Father, we are doing that. We are laying things aside to come, the things that are not necessary, to come and hear the things that are necessary. And so tonight, Holy Spirit of God, your presence is welcome in this building. You're here already. Do what you love to do the most, and that is glorify and honor Jesus in this place. And as you do this, may we go from glory to glory and from strength to strength. For I decree that your kingdom has come. Your will shall be done in here, in Panama City, in Fort Walton Beach, on this earth as it is in heaven. We declare this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and we give you all the glory, praise, and thanksgiving. And everybody that agrees shouts. Amen. Come on, give him praise for what he's going to do tonight. Give him praise. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, we might have heard Fort Walton on that one. Guys, I want to open up. Um, I'm going to share with you something that Pastor Steve asked me to share with you on tonight. Um, I've just finished a book. It's going to be published uh, February 21st. I believe it's a life message. I'm going to share a little bit out of it tonight. But when you talk about renew, everybody say renew. renew. I want to go to the scripture in the New Testament that will really speak to renew quicker than anything else. And that is James 4.8. James makes this statement. I want you to look at it carefully. I know you read it before. He said, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. Let's say that with me. Draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. Question, who draws first? We do. There's something that we do. We initiate that will literally cause the one who put the stars in the heavens with his fingers and called every one of them by name to come near me. I don't know about you, but that really excites me. In essence, what James is saying here is you, not God, are the one that determines the level of your relationship with him. Let me say it again. You are the one that determines the level of your relationship with God, not God. In all my traveling for years and years, I've met so many believers that have this deep-seated notion. They think that there are certain leaders that were born with like stars over their cribs, right? People like Billy Graham, Mother Teresa. No, these people were, these people are close to God because they chose to be. In fact, let me say this, in my four decades of ministry, some of the people that walk closest to the Lord, you're never going to see behind a pulpit. 
They're close because they've chosen to be close. When I think about this, I think about James saying in the fifth verse, the spirit who dwells in you and I yearns jealously for us. What I've really come to learn is that he's more passionate about being close to you than you are to him. I mean, when I think about this, I think about what David says in Psalm 139. I think it's around the 17th verse. He said, Lord, if I was to consider the thoughts that you have about me personally, this is not the church collectively. This is me personally. He said, if I was able to number those thoughts, they would outnumber every grain of sand that's on this planet. Now, I want you to stop and think about it. You people here can really relate to this. Every beach, every desert, every golf course, that's a lot of sand. Now, how many of you know you don't think about someone you don't want to be close to? You know, every year I discover stuff that I had that I didn't know I had. Because it's Christmas time and I go to the storage unit and there is stuff that I literally didn't think about for an entire year. Oh yeah, that's right, we do own that. When you're not interested in something, you don't think about it very much. Now, scientists tell us that in one cubic foot of beach out there, one cubic foot of beach, there are anywhere, depending upon how tightly it's packed, between 500,000 and a million grains of sand. Now, if I think about the person I'm the closest to, Lisa, and I add up all my thoughts that I've had about her in the last 40 years of marriage, which we just celebrated last week, down here, by the way, I wouldn't get a shoebox full. And I'm doing better than most husbands because you know what a shoebox full of sand would be? A thought every 12 seconds for 40 years, provided I didn't go to sleep in those 40 years. Now, how many of you know fishermen exaggerate? Come on. Repent now if that's you. Exaggeration's a lie. Let's just be honest. How many of you know God can't lie? If God was to ever exaggerate, he would have to come under the submission to the father of lies, and he'll never do it. So when God says, my thoughts about you outnumber every grain of sand that's on this planet, do you know how much he's thinking about you? That's why Jesus said, your hairs are numbered. He is a God, Moses said to the children of Israel, who is passionate about his relationship with you. So here's the deal. Here's God who wants to be so close with us. He passionately desires our fellowship. Why are so many believers distant from him? This is a question I had to face off with. Because the number one request that come from believers when I travel is, how do I get closer? Well, there's got to be a foundation in our life for us to be close with God. And without this foundation, it doesn't matter how much God wants to be close to us and how much we want to be close to him, it can't happen without this foundation. And this foundation can be found in a couple scriptures. I'll give you a couple of them. First of all, in Leviticus, the 10th chapter, the third verse, God makes, or Moses makes a statement and he says, by those who come near me. Now this is God speaking out of the mouth of Moses. By those who come near me, everybody say, draw near. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. You know, there's the should be's in scripture, and then there's the must be's. You're wise to heed the should be's. You're a fool to ignore the must be's. By those who come near me, I must. Be regarded as holy. How do we do this? Psalm 89, verse 7. God, look at this, is to be greatly feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence 
by all those around him. Look at the second part of this verse. God is to be held in reverence by all those who surround him. Let me make this statement. You will never find God, his manifest presence, you will never find it in an atmosphere where he's, unless he is held with the utmost of respect. Let me tell you, when I first learned this, back in 1997, it was January of 97, I was asked to the nation of Brazil to speak at a national conference. I was so, so excited because it was my first trip to Brazil. I remember flying down there. It was in the capital city. It was a national conference. People were coming from all over. And I landed Friday morning, prayed all afternoon. And that night, they drove me to the arena. I remember before we even got to the packed out parking lot, there were cars parked on the street for blocks away. I remember pulling into that reserved spot. When you get out, you could hear the worship and the crowd from the outside of the building because in the arenas down there, they have about a six foot gap between the ceiling and the upper wall to create air ventilation. And I could hear the worship that was going on in the inside. I was so excited. Now, back in those days, let me tell you something. They did something I'm so glad they stopped doing. They sat us ministers on the, on the platform, okay? So they, 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 they ushered me in and put me right on the platform. That's just so weird when you're worshiping God in front of everybody, right? I'm like, let me sit in the front row. But anyway, so, so um, I, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm on the platform. I'm excited. First time in Brazil. The, the place is, the arena is jam-packed. And the presence of God is nowhere. Now I'm talking about the manifest presence of God. Not his omnipresence. And I remember closing, I, I, I'm in shock. I mean, you would think just the energy in the room, Right? with that many people. And I I closed my eyes. I said, God, where's your presence? And I remember when I opened my eyes, it was like I started seeing people. And I saw people during the worship standing there like this, looking around with their arms crossed. I just had their hands in their pocket looking down. There were people talking to one another. Some people were walking down the stairs of the arena and going out to the concession stands, getting something to drink, coming back. I'm like... This will stop. So I go through the whole worship. And then one of the leaders of this massive church network down there comes up and begins reading from the scripture. And now because there's no music, you can hear the little mutter mutter of people whispering to each other, talking to each other. And I'm like, what is going on? And now I'm, I'm I'm getting quite upset. And I hear the Holy Spirit say, address this. So they introduced me, and I remember walking up and putting my right elbow on the podium. My my translator's right next to me, because I'm sitting there going, how do I get these people attention? And I remember just going up and standing there and staring at him, and not saying a word. Now, when you're the Friday night speaker of the National Conference in Brazil, and you've been introduced, and you're standing there staring at the people, that will get their attention. So after about 50 seconds... The whole place goes quiet, and every eye is on me. And when I knew every eye was on me, these are the first words I ever spoke in the nation of Brazil. I did not say, hi, it's nice to be here. Here's my family. Let me show you a picture. I didn't do any of that. I said, this is the first words that came out of my mouth. I have two questions. Question one, you're talking to somebody sitting across the table, and the whole time you're talking to them, they got their hands in their pocket looking around. They got their arms crossed looking down, or they're whispering to somebody beside them. Would you continue to talk to them? They said nothing, so I I answered it. I said, no, because I'm a little angry right now. What if every time you go to your neighbor's house, this is question number two, and you knock on the door, and when they open the door, they go, oh, it's you again. And they turn around, walk into the house. I said, will you continue to go? No. I said, I have been in this auditorium, this arena, For over an hour and a half, and there's not an ounce of the presence of God in this place. Why? Because God will never come into a place where he's not held with the utmost respect. I said, if the president of your nation would have walked on this platform tonight, you would have given him 10 times the respect you gave the Holy Spirit. I said, if Pele, your greatest soccer player in the history of Brazil, would have walked on this platform tonight, you would have been on the edge of your seats anticipating every word. I said, you've given no respect to the Spirit of God. And for the next 75 minutes, I preached him on the fear of the Lord.
after 75 minutes, I said, all right, you're in here. You say you're born again. This is a believer's conference. So, you know, they all said that we're Christians. I said, you say you're born again, but you lack the fear of God and you're willing to repent. Stand up. Three-fourths of the arena stands up. Soon as they stand up, the presence of God fills the arena. And, and, and people start crying. And I'm like, God, we didn't even pray. And I remember later him showing me that the father ran to the prodigal son before the prodigal son said any prayer of repentance. And so the presence of God fills the place. It, it, it's just wonderful. People weeping. And, and I'm finally like, finally, right? And it's so wonderful. And it lasts three minutes and it lives. And the Holy Spirit said, lead him in a prayer of repentance. So I led him in a prayer of repentance. After the prayer of repentance, another wave comes of his presence, and it's even stronger. And now it's just beautiful. It's just so amazing. I hear sobbing all over the arena. Last three or four minutes, it lifts. The Lord said, son, I'm coming one more time. Now, there's no way I can ever do this justice, but I want you to imagine standing in a forest, and about a 25-mile-an-hour wind starts blowing through that forest. That kind of a violent whistling wind came blowing into that arena when it did the people started screaming now can you imagine thousands of latinos screaming <laughs> how loud that is yet the wind was louder and i remember i am standing there right beside this pulpit and i am petrified in a good way i mean there are, look i know it sounds weird but there are like goosebumps on top of my goosebumps there was such an authority that came into that arena. It was like daddy didn't come in, the king came in. And I remember I am standing there and all that's coming out of my mouth is, oh my God, oh my God. And I remember the thought goes through my mind. John Bevere, you say one wrong word, you make one wrong move, you're dead. <laughs> now would that have happened? I don't know. It did with a couple in the New Testament. When they brought an offering and they were more concerned about people perceiving that they were giving cap uh, 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 sacrificially and they fell over dead in that kind of an atmosphere. Because Peter walks out of that atmosphere and walks down the streets of Jerusalem and everybody sick gets up. That's like Pastor Steve walking through one of the hospitals here and emptying the hospital. That kind of authority was in that room. He's not only dead, he's called the consuming fire. He's not only dead, he's called the king. And he came in, and I'm standing there, and I'd never encountered anything like this in my life. And I'm sitting there going, oh, my God, oh, my God. And, and the, this wind blows for 90 seconds. It gradually subsides. It leads in its wake. People collapse over the seats in front of them, people weeping. And I'm standing there. I'm like, God, what do I do? What do I do? And the Lord's like, I'm through with you. <laughs> So I looked at the leader. I said, it's all yours. <laughs> so they, they whisked me out to the car, and they put me in the car, and then they put the national solo singer that night. There was a soloist. She's a female, very, very well-known in Brazil. And her husband, and she gets in the car. She goes, did you hear the wind? Did you hear the wind? And I said, maybe it was a jet aircraft that flew over the building, right? Oh, my gosh, and she got mad at me. What are you talking about? I saw fire all around the building. And I, and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, these Brazilians are passionate. So... Her husband quiets her down and goes, he's a little calmer man. He goes, sir, that, that wasn't an airplane. I said, how do you know? He said, because there were security men and policemen all around the outside. They're union men. They're not, most of them aren't even saved. They were around the outside of the building. When the wind started blowing, they came running in and said to our leaders, what in the world's going on? He said, secondly, I, I was at the main soundboard because I'm making sure my wife's volumes are right for her singing. He said, the decimal meters were at zero the whole time the wind blew. He said, John, not one ounce of that sound came through our sound system. I said, my God, take me in my hotel room. I remember just sitting on my balcony till 1.30 in the morning worshiping. See, you want, you want to see New Testament on this? The book of Hebrews says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably. How do we serve God acceptably? With reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. I'll never forget Saturday morning, I walk into that building and the miracles that happened, the salvations that occurred was mind blowing. All because of one thing, presence. All because of holy fear. 
We had reports on this for as many as 23 years, 22 years later. 2016, I go down to speak to Guayana, Brazil, to 12,000 pastors and leaders. I get out of the car, the first pastor I meet, he says, I was in the building 20 years ago when the wind blew. My life has never been the same since. When that kind of a presence comes, you change. There's no other way of saying it. I was in the nation of Malaysia two years later. Similar situation. You say, John, does this happen a lot? I wish I could say yes. But basically, in my 40 years, about a handful of times. Same thing occurred. It was a national meeting. And I remember that presence came in. And I, I, I remember, again, I'm thinking, Bevere, don't you do one thing Don't do one thing irreverent or you're dead. And I'm thinking that. And I remember I'm walking back and forth going, oh, my God, oh, my God. Same thing again. And I remember my mouth said something that my ears heard for the first time in my life. But I'm walking back and forth. And out of my mouth comes this. This is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And my head all of a sudden kicked in. I went, oh my gosh, that's right. That's one of the seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit. See, Isaiah prophesied about Jesus. He said, look at this. He said, the spirit, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Jesus. The spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding. The spirit of counsel and the spirit of might. The spirit of knowledge and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Now look at this. His delight. Are you seeing this? His delight was in the fear of the Lord. Shouldn't Jesus' delight be our delight? Let me try that again. Shouldn't his delight be our delight? You know, Jim talked about last night about Elijah. Let let, let, let me put a PS on Jim's message last night because it was profound. I shared it with my whole staff on Zoom today, all 50 of them. They all got so fired up when I preached Jim's message. (laughs) They did. I'm not kidding. They got so fired up. I was so in awe last night. It was like a father in the church stood up and gave orders. It was so beautiful last night. So anyway, uh, where was I going with this? Um, I shared it with my staff today. Da, 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 da. Huh? Oh, yeah. This is a P.S. on Jim's message. Thanks. <laughs> Have you ever read in Hebrews? In the days of his flesh, he had vehement cries and tears to the one who could save him. And what does the Bible say about Jesus? And he was heard because of his godly fear. It's one thing to pray. It's another thing to be heard. It's one thing to draw near. It's another thing for him to draw near. Still with me? I remember I'm walking out of this Malaysia auditorium. And the pastor was so wise. I was so relieved. He didn't say, oh, let's do a song. He got up at the end of that one, because that one lasted about 10 minutes. And he said... Y'all, there, there's such a heavy presence of God here. Just leave whenever you want. Wow. We're done as far as the service goes. But God's not. And I remember after a while, I felt, okay, I can leave. And I'm walking out, and there's this, because it, it was the largest Bible school in Malaysia. There were pastors from all over the nation that had come. And I remember there was this Indian couple. They were in the, the Bible school. And I'm walking out, and we're just looking at each other. And, and we had nothing to say. <laughs> because when you're in that atmosphere, you're like, don't say something stupid. So I'm just looking at them. They're looking at me. And then she opens her mouth and she said, I feel so clean. I went, that's it. That's it. Now I didn't respond like that. I went inside. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's what I felt in Brazil. That's what I felt in North Carolina. That's what I feel here. So I go back to my hotel. Next morning, I'm getting ready to play basketball with the guys in Malaysia, right? And I'm putting my gym shorts on, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me. He said, son, read Psalm 19. I'm like, okay. I don't know what I'm going to read in Psalm 19, but I just know, do it. So I go over, get my Bible, I, with my, you know, ready to go play basketball, but I, I you know, I'm, I'm going to do this, <laughs> right? So I, I start reading verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. I get to verse 9, and look what I read. The fear of the Lord is clean. I went, oh my gosh, there it is. Now look at, look at the next statement. Look at the next statement. Enduring forever. Holy Spirit spoke to me in that room. He said, son, Lucifer led worship right before my throne, beheld my glory, was anointed to do so. 
It was good worship tonight, but can you imagine being anointed in a building that seats over a billion beings and you're the worship leader standing in front of the glory of God, leading heaven. God said he was, he led worship right before the presence of my glory. He didn't fear me. He didn't endure forever. He said, son, a third of my angels surrounded my throne. They beheld my glory. They didn't fear me. They didn't endure forever. He said, son, Adam and Eve walked in the garden in the presence of my glory. They didn't fear me. They didn't endure forever. He said, son, every created being that surrounds my throne throughout eternity will have been tested in the holy fear of God. Then I started thinking this, and I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or me. How many pastors started the ministry so excited, so in love with Jesus, but they didn't endure forever? Paul the Apostle makes this statement in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. This one's really bugging me, folks. The day of Jesus' return will not come except the apostasy comes first unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come. Why? Why? Barna did a study between 2000 and 2020. One of his biggest studies he's done. He studied 20 years and you know what he discovered? Over 20 million American practicing Christians in that 20 years are now non-Christians. Many of them professing to be agnostics and atheists. 20 million. That's more than 5% of America's population. That means one out of every 20 people between 2000 and 2020 walked away from the faith. Paul said it had to happen. Why is it happening? Because of the lack of holy fear. Paul the apostle makes this statement in Philippians, the second chapter, the 12th and 13th verse. He said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not love and kindness. I'll never forget 1994. I, I didn't really understand the fear of the Lord. I was starting to study it. I thought, you know what? This, this occurs too much in the Bible to ignore. It's in the New Testament all over the place. And my assistant gets a call in 1994. Jim Baker, who at that time was probably one of the most famous men on the planet, but for the wrong reasons. He was on CNN. He committed mail fraud, had the largest ministry in the world. And he was sentenced to 45 years. It was reduced to five years. In the fourth year of his sentence, he called his assistant. He read the first book that I wrote called Victory in the Wilderness. And he said to his assistant, can you call this man and see if he'll come visit me? I said, sure, I'll go visit him. So I go in. I remember I'm in the penitentiary. Jim comes in. He's got his prison garb on. He looks at me, grabs my shoulder and said, young man, did you write this book? I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, not a ghostwriter? I said, no, not a ghostwriter. He said, we have so much to talk about. And we only have 90 minutes. He sits down. He looks at me. You know what the first thing he says to me is? John, this prison wasn't God's judgment on my life. It was his mercy. I went, what? He said, John, if I would have kept living the way I was living, I would have ended up in hell forever and ever. I am so grateful to God. Then he told me how he was delivered the first year. He told me how they had a, a church in the prison and, and, the, and that they go through the, the gospel of Jesus. They go the sentence of Jesus. Then they go five words, three words, one word, three words, five words. I'm just going through this whole day. I'm like, well, you're leading this, this church in the prison, right? He goes, oh, no. I'm a master manipulator. I'm not touching it. Somebody else is leading it. John, if I ever go back to living the way I was living, I'm, I'm, I'm done forever. I mean, I'm sitting there going, whoa. So 20 minutes into it, I look at Jim and I say, Jim, when did you fall out of love with Jesus? When, at what point did you fall out of love with Jesus? And he looked at me and he said, I didn't. And he's so serious when he said it. He said, I didn't. I said, now, now I'm mad. Because I don't know this man. I just met him for the first time that day. Now I'm mad at him again. Because <laughs> I was 
Well, anyway. <laughs> and, and, and now he's like, I love this man so much. And I said, Jim, you committed adultery with Jessica Hahn in 1983. You were arrested and prosecuted in 1990. You telling me those seven years you didn't love Jesus? He said, I loved him all the way through it, John. And he sees confusion in my face. And he looks at me, he says, I didn't fear God. And I went, what? He said, I love Jesus. I didn't fear God. He said, there's millions of American Christians just like me. They love Jesus. They don't fear God. So what is the fear of the Lord? What is it? First of all, it is not to be scared of God. How can you have a relationship of intimacy with somebody you're scared of? Amen. You know, when Moses delivers Israel out of Egypt, where does he bring them? Not to the promised land. He brings them to the place that he met with God, where the bush was. It's called Sinai. Remember he said to Pharaoh, like five times, thus saith the Lord, let my people go that might worship me in the desert. Why does he want to bring them to a promised land before he first brings them to the promiser? And when he brings them to that mountain, he has a private meeting with God. And God says to Moses in Exodus like 19, 2 and 3, he says, hey, Moses, you just go down and tell all those people the whole reason I delivered them from Egypt was to bring them to myself. I can't wait to meet them. They're my kids. So three days later, God comes down on the mountain. When he cut does, they all scream and run away because they got too much of the world in them. And they scream and run away. And they say, Moses, Moses, you talk with God. Tell us whatever he says. We're going to do it. But we can't handle him. And Moses makes this statement to them in Exodus 20, 20, that I believe is a 2020 vision. Look what Moses said. He said, do not fear. For God has come to test you. What's the test? That his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Wait a minute. Look up at me. Do not fear because God's come to test you. What's the test? See if his fear is in you. He, he's, he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. He's contradicting himself. No, he's not. He is differentiating between being scared of God and the fear of the Lord. There's a difference. The person that's scared of God has something to hide. What does, what does Adam do as soon as he disobeys God? He hides from the presence of, of the Lord. The person who fears God has nothing to hide. He or she is terrified of being away from God. So if you want your first definition of the fear of the Lord, you ready? Write it down. This is what it is. It is to be not scared. It is to be terrified of being away from God. Good preaching. I'll help some of you right now. That was a really good place to say amen right there. It's being terrified of being away from him. Still with me? So when you fear God, you venerate him. I know that's a big word. Let me, let me break it down. To honor, to respect, you esteem, you value, you reverence, and you stand in awe of him more than anything or anyone else. When you do, you firmly embrace God's heart, and that means we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. Notice it doesn't say we dislike what he hates. Now let's just get rid of the religious spirit, okay? Okay. Yeah, man, I fear God. That's why I hate them sinners over there. You don't fear God at all because you hate what he loves. He loves them enough to die for them. Don't tell me you fear God. Don't insult the fear of the Lord like that. You hate what he hates. You know what God hates? He hates the sin that undoes them and makes them because he loves them. Still with me? I, you know, back in the 1990s, I was praying two hours every single morning. Not kidding. And then I'd come home and read my Bible. I'd go outside to a deserted place, a construction place, and I'd pray from five to seven every morning. And you know what? When I preached, my words went boing, 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 boing. And I was so fed up. I was like, God, I spend so much time in prayer. Where's the power? Where's the anointing? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, I'll, I'll never forget it. I was frustrated. And I went, why isn't there a stronger anointing on my life? And he said to me, because you tolerate sin. Not only in your life, but in the lives of others. And he said, read Hebrews 1. So you know, Hebrews 1 is where God the Father inaugurates Jesus as king of the universe. Look what he says. Look what he says to Jesus. This is amazing. He says, because you have loved righteousness. Stop right there. Every Christian in America loves righteousness. That's what Jim Baker was saying. Because you have loved righteousness, but he didn't stop there. And hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, even your God has anointed you more than your companions. Holy Spirit said to me, Learn to hate sin the way I hate sin. You'll see the anointing increase upon your life. 
Why don't our prayers have power? Why don't we preach with power? Why don't we walk in power? Because we tolerate sin. We've allowed society, the fear of man, to overcome us. Sure is quiet right now. So what is the manifestation of somebody who fears God? What is its manifestation? Do you understand what I'm saying by what is the manifestation? Does everybody understand? Okay, I see, right? right? I'm talking to you, Panama City, and to you, Fort Walton Beach. What's, in other words, like, if, if I take a knife and I put it in a wall socket over there, and you're not doing my funeral three days from now, that means there is no power in that outlet, right? But if you're doing my funeral, that means there is power in the outlet. So what is the evidence of somebody who truly fears God? It's five areas. Number one, they obey God instantly. Oh. Number two, they obey him even when it doesn't make sense. God ever tell you to do something that didn't make sense? Number three, they obey him even if it hurts. Number four, they obey him even if they don't see a benefit. Number five, they obey him to completion. It comes down to obedience is the manifestation of somebody who fears God. Now, I'm going to show you my favorite scripture and try to wrap it up here in the next 15 minutes. Psalm 25, verse 14. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. 25, verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he'll show them his covenant. Everybody say the secret. That word actually means secrets. The secrets of the Lord are with those who fear him. How many of you have secrets? Let me see your show of hands. Put up your hands really high. All right, do I pray for the rest of you for lying now or later? <laughs> there, how many of you know all secrets are not bad? Okay, so now how many of you have secrets? Everybody's going to raise their hand. Okay. <laughs> Who do you share your secrets with? Acquaintances or intimate close friends? Intimate close friends. God's no different. God says, I share my secrets with my intimate close friends. And by the way, my intimate close friends are those who fear me. Now, I'm going to show you I'm not taking this verse out of context. Look at it out of the New Living Translation. Friendship with the Lord is reserved for those who fear him. With them, he shares his secrets. God is not everybody's friend. I'm going to get a little more specific. God is not everybody's friend in the church. Now, there are two men that are called the friends of God in the Old Testament. Were there others? Oh, you better believe it. David's a friend of God. Esther's a friend of God. You know, I could go on and on and on. Joseph, Daniel. But these two men's lives exemplify what it takes to have a relationship of friendship with the Lord. Who's the first one? Who is the first one? Abraham, right? Why is Abraham called the friend of God? Because when Abraham is old, God comes to him one night and says, Abe, yes, Lord, yes, yes. Abe, you know your son who you waited for for 25 years that I gave to you? the one you love more than anything or anyone else, I want you to go on a three-day journey and kill him for me. <laughs> okay, we read this story. We know what happens. He didn't. Can you imagine the sleepless night? But do you know what the Bible says? Early the next morning, Abraham's on the way. You know how people say, well, you know, the Lord's been dealing with me about this now for three months. Ha, ha, ha. Oh my gosh, you're bragging about your lack of holy fear. <laughs> you, 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 you. Come on. Now, God gives him a three day journey. Why? It's easier when you heard the booming voice of God the night before, but what about two and a half days later when you haven't heard one word from heaven and you're looking at the mountain, you're going to put the most important person or thing to death in your life just because God said do it and didn't give you a reason. Abraham goes up there. Can you imagine the emotions? He is building this altar. He is hoping for some kind of sign to get out of this. He ties up Isaac who he loves so much, he lifts up the knife, he's ready to put the most important person or thing to death in his life just because God said do it. And right when he's ready to run it through Isaac, an angel appears and says, Abraham, stop! Because now I know you fear God. Whoa, 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 whoa. How does the angel know that he fears God? Because he obeyed God instantly. 
Because he obeyed God when it didn't make sense. Because he obeyed God when it hurt. Because he obeyed God when he didn't see a benefit. And because he obeyed God to completion. Abraham puts down the knife, unties Isaac, lifts his eyes, there's a ram, and out of his spirit comes Jehovah Jireh. The Lord who sees. Do you understand? God just revealed a facet of his personality to Abraham nobody had ever known before. Because he's my friend. Okay, you're not getting this. Okay. All of you, all of you know me as John Bevere preacher. Some of you know me as John Bevere author. But there is a lady. And whoa, she's a lady. She knows me as John Bevere best friend. She knows me as John Bevere husband, John Bevere father, John Bevere G daddy. She knows me as John Bevere athlete. She knows me as John Bevere lover. Now, can I say this? None of you will ever know me as John Bevere lover. (laughs) That is a facet of my personality that is reserved for the person that is most closest to me on this earth. Amen. God just revealed a facet of his personality to Abraham. Nobody's ever known before because he's my friend. Now look at the relationship between God and Abraham. It's amazing. One day the Lord says, should we do what we're planning on doing to Sodom and Gomorrah without first talking to our friend Abraham? So the Lord comes down, tear up a trace. They have a meal. The angels go off. And and Abraham and God walk over the cliff. And God looks at Abe and goes, Abe, we're thinking about blowing up these two cities. What do you think? (laughs) Abe goes, Sodom? Yeah, 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 and Gomorrah, what do you think? Abraham goes, think, 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 my nephew's over there, my nephew's over there. Oh my gosh, think, think, think. Okay, God, you wouldn't like blow up the cities if there were 50 righteous people, would you? You wouldn't judge the righteous with the unrighteous, would you? And the Lord goes, excellent idea, excellent idea. Okay, we will not blow up the cities if there's 50 righteous people. Glad we talked to our friend Abraham. Abraham goes, what if there's 50? Okay, God, wait a minute, whoa, whoa. What if there's 45? The Lord goes, another good idea. Okay, we will not blow up the cities if there's 45. Glad we talked to our friend Abraham. Abraham goes 40, 30, 20, 10. He figures there's got to be 10. Lots, one, all I need is nine others. There's not even 10. (laughs) Now, listen to what the Bible's saying. Listen, listen, listen. The people of Sodom are buying, selling, marrying, giving in marriage, planting, harvesting. What What is that in today's vernacular? The economy is great. Life is good, and if there is a God, he doesn't mind a lifestyle. They're 24 hours away from being obliterated, and they're clueless. That's not what's scary. Can I show you what's scary? Lot. Everybody say Lot. Lot. Who the Bible calls righteous. Okay, I'll, I'll put it in today's terms. Second Peter chapter 1, it's called righteous, okay? Saved. Born again. He's 24 hours away from being obliterated, and he's as clueless as Sodom and Gomorrah. It takes two angels of mercy, two messengers of mercy, because Abraham prayed. Thank God Abraham prayed to get him out. So here's two righteous men, two saved men, two born-again men. I'm going to put it in today's vernacular. One righteous saved, born a man. Again, man knows what God's going to do before he does it and helps God decide how he's going to do it. The other righteous, say, born again, man is as clueless as the world. Why? Because this righteous, say, born again, man fears God. Therefore, God shares his secrets with him. This righteous, say, born again, man does not fear God. He only knows God by how he answers his prayers. See, if you look at Moses, he's the other one. God said, I trust Moses. He's my friend. I speak to him face to face like a man speaks to his friend. The Bible says that Israel knew his acts. Moses knew his ways. What does it mean Israel knew God by his acts? Israel knew by God how God, excuse me, Israel knew God by how he answered their prayers. On the other hand, Moses knew many times what God was going to do before he did it and even did it and even helped God decide how to do it. And twice he changed God's mind. The Bible says the Lord relented because of what Moses said to him. So here's two righteous groups of people. Remember, coming out of Egypt is a type of being saved. They ate the same spiritual food. They drank the same spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ. One righteous man knows what God's going to do before he does it and helps God decide how he's going to do it often and even changes God's mind. The other group only knows God by how he answers their prayers. You know how many people I meet? 
Their relationship to God is limited. Well, you know, we prayed once and God healed our daughter. Okay? And he's okay with this and this and this and this. And you're going, what God are you talking about? What Jesus are you talking about? See, Paul said to the Corinthian church, you put up with what any, anybody tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus. He didn't say a different God, a different Jesus. Jesus is invisible. We can make up our Jesus however we want. And my Jesus is okay with me sleeping with my girlfriend. It's not the Jesus at the right hand. You made up a Jesus. You have no fear of God. But I love God. How can you love someone you don't know? You're like the fan of Michael Jordan. When you meet him on the street, he's not even going to acknowledge you. I don't know. Who are you? You know there's a multitude of people going to say, Jesus, you're my Lord. I don't know you. Who are you? Depart from me. You want to see it in the New Testament? And I'll close. You want to see it in the New Testament? Jesus is with the eleven. Judas is already gone. And look what he says to the 11. No longer do I call you servants. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Stop right there. The fact that he says that means at what time they were looked at and merely regarded as servants. That is not a revelation. That's an English lesson. Now, why does God do that? Why does God keep us, even though we're heirs, at a level of a servant? To protect us. Because he loves us so much. He doesn't want what happened to Ananias and Sapphira to happen to us. Okay, I'm going to give you an example. It's weak, but it works. Lisa and I work for two very large ministries. One had 150 paid employees. The other one had 450. When we were launched to start Messenger International in 1990, we said we are going to have a new style of leadership. We're going to be every employee. This was mine. I'm going to be every employee's best buddy. (laughs) Some of you already know the stupidity. So the first guy we hire, his name's John, best buddy. We're playing basketball. We're watching videos. He's hanging out at the house. He has dinner with us like every other night. Best buddy. He was really good for the first year until I had to bring some minor correction to him. I remember sitting him down. I said, John, look, when you're at our resource table and people come up, you got this look on your face like bug off. I said, these are God's sheep. You need to be kind. You need to have a smile on your head. He, he looks across the desk and goes, you're this and you're that and you're this and starts railing on me. And I went, whoa. I said, God, what do I do? And the Holy Spirit said, fire him. (laughs) So I let him completely vent. I let him completely vent. And I said, John, I got to release you. I'm I'm sorry, you can't work for us anymore. So he storms out, right? He's mad. I start crying because I really cared about the guy. God speaks to me and says, he'll be back and he'll be twice as faithful. Three months later, I get a call from him. Haven't heard from him in three months. He said, John, God's spoken to me like he's never spoken to me in my life. He said, I took you and Lisa for granted. I lost sight of the place God had put you in my life. I lost sight of the place God had put me in your life. I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? I said, yeah. We talked a few more minutes. I said, will you come work for us again? He said, yeah, I'd love to. He came back. We never had problems in that area again. Now today, we've got 50 employees here in the United States, and then we've got 1,000 team members around the world. I have a new policy. (laughs) I will not open up and share the intimate details of my life with any of my employees until I know they're very established in who I am in their life. And I'm very, some of my employees are my best friends, but I won't bring them in like that until I know they're very established because I almost destroyed that young man. Now, why does God do this with us? Because the Bible says, as long as the heir is a child, he differs nothing from the servant. Galatians 4.1. Why does God do this? Because God says, until you are very established in who I am and very established in who you are before me, the fear of the Lord. I got to keep you at a servant level because I don't want what happened to Ananias and Sapphira to happen to you. But when you are established in the holy fear of God, then I can bring you in as one of my intimate, close friends. Look what Jesus says, and I'll close. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. The master's ways, the secret is wisdom. But I have called you friends. Now, look at, he makes a statement to the entire church. Look at verse 14. You are my friends. Stop right there. We sing songs about it. We preach sermons, but we never finish the statement. If is a condition. If I say to you, I will pay you $2,000 if you work for me 40 hours, and you don't work the 40 hours, and then you say, where's the money? I say, hey, man, I said, if you work the 40 hours, you didn't fulfill the condition. 
Friendship with Jesus is conditional, not salvation. It's a gift. Salvation's a gift. We are talking about intimate friendship. Jesus said, you are my friends if, what's the condition, Jesus? If you do whatever I command you. There it is. The fear of the Lord trembling at his word. Well, I just think the Bible was written 2,000 years ago. And, you know, they didn't understand that 90% of the people before they get married, they live together. You have no fear of God. You have none. And you're not doing what he's commanding you because you put conditions on it. You put what society has said on that condition. And so don't even tell me he's your Lord because Jesus said, why do you call me Lord yet you don't do what I say? You know what Jesus is saying here? Not everybody in the church is my intimate close friend. But now listen, listen. I want you all to look at me because I want to end on high. (laughs) He passionately wants to be everyone's intimate close friend. But, whoa, 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 but you're the one that determines the level of your relationship with God, not God. Therefore, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Amen? Amen? I want every head bowed, every eye closed, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in Jesus' name. And I'm speaking to Fort Walton. I'm speaking to Panama City Beach. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to just bow your head. I want this to be you and God. Your spouse may be sitting next to you. Just right now, just, just, just don't even hold hands. Just, just right now, just you go right there with Jesus. You can never, ever experience a relationship with your creator, an authentic relationship without the holy fear of God. And let me show you where it first shows up. It's it's called salvation. Paul said, to you Jews and to everyone who fears God, this message of salvation has come. I think one of the things that's kept people from coming into an intimate relationship with Jesus is the way we do altar calls. We just say, you want to become a child of God, just pray this prayer, Jesus, come into my life. No, the apostle Paul made a statement. He said, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two shall be one. And he said, but this is an illustration of the way the church and Jesus are one. Jesus is called the groom, we're called the bride. Hey, when a girl gets married, on the day that she marries, when she walks down that church with a white dress on, She's making a pretty bold statement. She's saying goodbye to about 3.9 billion guys. She's saying, this is the one and only man I'm giving my entire heart to. The only way you can enter into an authentic relationship is when you give him everything. He is not coming back for a bride that has given herself half-heartedly to him. He's coming back for a bride that has given herself to him the way he gave himself to her. And when I think about it, my creator coming to this earth, knowing he's gonna be shamed, dishonored, spit on, beat, punched in the face, having his beard plucked out, thorns jammed into his skull. My creator, the one who created everything, knows this is gonna happen. He knows he's gonna get his flesh ripped off his back by the whip with broken bones and metal objects. He knows he's going to get nails driven right into his hands and feet. He did it because he loved you. That's how much he loved you. Your creator, innocent. He's not coming back for a bride and sleeping with the world. I don't, I, want to, I don't want you to be deceived. I don't want you to be one of the multitudes that call him Lord. And he's going to say, I don't know who you are. Who are you? Some of you are sitting here in all of these campuses, all three, and you know, you know, you know right now because the Holy Spirit is being gracious to you because, listen, a lot of people prayed for you tonight. You know you haven't given your entire heart and life to him. You know it. Have you done what that bride does on that wedding day? Broken up with every boyfriend and made a decision, I'm not going to enter into anything else. It means you break up with everything Jesus died for and you make no allowance to enter back into relationship with it. 
And you're sitting there and you say, I know I haven't given him my entire heart. And I want to do it right now. I want to do it right now, John. If that's you, I want you to stand up right where you're sitting. Stand up right now. Right? Right now. Just stand up quickly. No bride's ever been ashamed of her groom. All over this auditorium, there's, there's probably a 80 people standing to their feet. Just keep standing. If that's you. In, in Fort Walton Beach, in Panama City Beach, just, just stand to your feet if that's you. Yes, ma'am. You're worth the wait. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anybody else? I want to make sure there's nobody missing. Yes, sir. Thank you. You are well worth the wait, sir. Anybody else? I want to make sure nobody's missed. Anyone else? Now, if you're sitting down and you'd say, John, I have given Jesus my life, but I'm not walking in the fear of the Lord. I can see how that's bled into my life. And I want this holy fear, what Jesus delighted in. I want it in my life. If that's you, you say, I've been not been walking in the fear of the Lord, and I want that in my life. I want you to stand up with these people right now immediately. Stand up quickly. Talk about renewal. Talk about renewal. I'm so proud to be called a member of this church. I know it's probably the same in Panama City Beach. I'm probably looking at 95% of you standing up here. It's probably the same in Fort Walton. I want you to just lift your hands up right there. I'm not going to call you forward. There's just too, too, too many. Just lift your hands up. I want you to forget about the person beside you. I want you to close your physical eyes and I want you to open the eyes of your heart and I want you to look at him. I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to give you a glimpse. Spirit of God, I'm asking you, sir. Please show them Jesus. Please show us Jesus. Just open the eyes of your heart. You see his eyes? Do you see his face? I'm going to tell you what I see. I see a massive smile. A joyful smile. <laughs> I see eyes that are delighted and so filled with love and so f focused. You see his eyes? His arms are outstretched. Thank you for your presence. He's here. Holy Spirit, thank you. That's his presence right there. Master. Master. Say this with me. Say, speak to the one you're looking at. Dear Lord, I love you so much. Say it out loud. I love you so much. Forgive me for living life my way, for only obeying you when it was convenient, when it didn't interfere with my schedule, my pleasure, my agenda. I'm so sorry. And I repent tonight, and I turn to you. I give you my spirit, my soul, and my body. Everything I am, everything I have, I'm yours forever, Jesus. You are my Lord, my King, my beloved, my groom. I'm yours forever. 
I want to be your friend. I want to know your heart. I want to know your secrets. Give me the grace, the holy fear to walk in obedience. Now lift your hands up high. I want to pray that God the Father will baptize you in the Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord. I want you to just receive. Heavenly Father. No, no, no. You can just receive now. Heavenly Father. You said if we'd ask you, you'd give your spirit to your children. These are your children. Your beloved. They love you deeply. Give us the gift, the treasure of holy fear. Baptize us with the Holy Spirit of the fear of the Lord. Fill us to where we overflow, to where it's a fountain of wisdom, a fountain of insight. 